Hi, everyone. How are you doing? This is Larry Port from Rocket Matter. I am here with Dave Maxfield, and we have a hot CLU for you today. Improve profits and sanity by running a lean law firm. Please familiarize yourself with the GoToMeeting control panel. You got some questions. Um, we'll be checking those throughout the presentation. So we would like uh, this to be interactive. Uh, webinars are a lot more interesting if they're interactive. So definitely, if you have questions, write them in. Um, and we'll stop periodically and take a look at those kind of things. How are you doing today, Dave? I'm doing great, Larry. Thanks for having me. Oh, no. Thanks for uh, saying, thanks for accepting. So um, before we get in and talk all about Dave for the next 50 minutes, um, <laughs> let's just say that, you know, Dave and I, um, we wrote this book, The Lean Law Firm, um, and we have an we have a URL for it and everything. And, uh, you know, it's an ABA published book. And we presented this presentation at the ABA Tech Show. And Dave, how, how would you say it was received? Unbiased. I think it, I think people felt like it had the appearance of complete legitimacy. But no, I, from, from an unbiased <laughs> standpoint, I think it went uh, very well. And I think it's a, a message that a lot of people are receptive to because, you know, as, as lawyers, and I'm a, I'm a lawyer, um, you know, we struggle with, you know, this sort of this central question of what should I be doing right now? You know, in a big firm, you have people to tell you what to do, um, at least as a younger lawyer, uh, but in a smaller firm or, you know, on your own, like, like I am with some employees, um, you know, there's sort of, there's always this question of, uh, you know, what should I be doing right now? What's the most productive thing I could be doing right now? And so many of the systems that we see developed, like, you know, David Allen's getting things done, uh, things like that are attempts to sort of answer that question. Um, but, you know, lawyers, and I include myself in this number, sometimes can get so uh, geeked out on on these things that, um, and we probably all know people like this, sort of switch from system to system all the time looking for the holy grail um, without really giving it time to, uh, you know, ever take root and really work for you. So the, the thing that I think is great about this and what makes it receptive is, um, not to say that it's the holy grail, but it's something that we know works. And it's something that always answers that question of, you know, what should I be doing right now? Because the system makes clear to you um, pretty much what needs to be done and what needs attention. So, all right, well, and, and I would say to get the most out of this hour, I would, uh, you have to have this attitude that you are open to kind of taking a look at your firm from the outside looking in. So um, let's get started. Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a sole practitioner in Columbia, South Carolina. I've been practicing going, getting close to 25 years. Um, I uh, am interested in uh, improving processes a lot. And early on in my career, um, began looking in sort of traditional places, you know, uh, you know, how to better manage your law firm books. And a lot of the things I saw were written a long time ago or for bigger firms. And so um, got really interested in things um, that manufacturing industry industries like Toyota were doing, um, kind of, you know, as we say, systems geek, kind of geeked out on those things and tried to figure out ways that we could, you know, adapt those into, uh, you know, use in a law firm. But my day-to-day -day practice is consumer protection law, which means I mainly represent people against uh, banks, insurance companies, car dealerships, credit reporting agencies, and debt collectors. Um, and, you know, in a small practice, it's, you know, Amazingly, in some ways, you know, these things that giant manufacturing industries do actually uh, those principles translate quite well. So that's a little about me. Larry, what about you? This is me. Um, for those of you that are new to the Rocket Matter team, this um, or, or familiar, unfamiliar with our brand, I started Rocket Matter about 10 years ago, a little bit more actually, but we're publicly available now 10 years ago in February. Um, I like to coach Little League. I got a kid who plays. Um, you know, uh, not much to say about me. I'm a software engineer that had to go and learn how to run a business. So I kind of stumbled into the same techniques that Dave stumbled into. And what I bring into the table is that I am not a lawyer, but, um, and actually I think it's an advantage in this thing because I'm, I'm coming from an outsider's perspective. Uh, from my perch running Rocket Matter, I see how thousands and thousands of law firms operate. And I, I view it not from like uh, practice management, perspective, like from, you know, like some that work at your bar association, but I look at it as someone who's learned to run their own business and has like learned a whole bunch of tricks. And what I saw was pretty shocking. And so um, I started kicking around these ideas. Hey, if, if a whole bunch of these ideas 
migrated from production over to the software industry already, but they hadn't migrated to law. And, you know, I'm looking at this thinking that kind of similar to a law firm, if I screw up, I'm in a whole bunch of trouble, just like lawyers are. So is, is it really so different? Like, could these ideas be applied? And that's kind of how Dave and I started talking about how this whole thing came about. And the observation that I have uh, working with law firms is that a lot of law firms are in survival mode. Now, keep in mind that we it's not just that we provide software to them. You know, they, they call in, they have support tickets, we observe them. Sometimes we sit down in their offices and see how they operate. And it looks like, you know, this is Maslow's hierarchy of, pure, uh, of, of, of needs, right? So um, the big joke is that Wi-Fi is now like, um, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid. <laughs> but in, in, re, in reality, it's, it, the, the issue is that it, they, it seemed like a World War I trench or what I've heard of a World War I trench with the judge would call, opposing counsel would call, completely hectic environment and um, just not a good situation, not the kind of situation where you can actually take time out to plan or run an efficient process. So that was the observation. And the big thing that we do here is that we are always trying to look from the outside in. On, on a day-to-day -day basis, we're in knee deep in operations, um, but we do take a look at things on a monthly basis. Um, we have you know little meetings at the, to kick off every single day. We have big annual planning meetings where we leave. We have quarterly planning meetings where we get off site. So the most important thing is that you, you, you really can't get anywhere unless you step back and gain perspective. So, um, and then there's, that there's there's ways of doing this that are effective that we're going to talk about but this is step one you have to be willing to get outside so anyhow this is a picture of the book um do we have a slide that has uh it's you can you can go to leanlawfirmbook.com and take a look at the book and that's there's a link to where you can purchase it from the aba um and we have our podcast on there dave and i have started to uh, produce a weekly podcast that we're going to be doing ongoing and if this is a topic that interests you uh, definitely get in touch with us listen to the podcast or so on and so forth so um here's how we laid out the book dave do we talk about how we laid out the book or do we kind of skip through this i, I can't remember I, well uh we do talk about it i mean yeah let's talk about it all right let's do it so um one thing you should know is that this is the first book published by the aba that has graphic novel elements. Now, there's a couple of classic books that we're gonna be referencing in the future, it, in, in the immediate future, like in the next 10 minutes future. Uh, one of them <laughs> is called The Goal. And this was uh, written by uh, an Israeli physicist who became an industrial engineering uh, sage. And it, it is written in the form of a novel. So we, we borrowed ideas from that. So the first half of each chapter tells the story of a lawyer, um, and Dave's gonna run through the story a little bit. Um, but that's what we try and do. That's how we introduce the ideas. So, you know, it's a, it, it's the sugar that makes the medicine go down a little bit better. We go through systems thinking, we go through the basics. Uh, we talk about key performance indicators, KPIs, what they are, which ones you should be looking to, um, how to start building your system, how these ideas can be applied to marketing. Um, you know, coming down with repeatable processes to keep everybody that you hire on board and make sure that your system continues to function properly, how to meet effectively um, and use tech to do this kind of stuff and then w a lot of it is theory but most of it is rubber meets the road because we only put stuff in this book that actually we found to be effective Does exactly that, good? that sounds really good yeah go, you want to go to the next slide and we can uh or you, well, you talk about that then i'll hit the story in just a little bit okay so the big analogy that we put in here is that it's 1911 for the practice of law Okay. In other words, um, this is when industrial engineering got kicked off. This is when the principles of scientific management uh, was published by Frederick Winslow Taylor. And so it, this was like kind of a seminal event in, in business history. You know, it's, it, it's when we really started measuring the effectiveness of techniques. Right. And so like, we like to say that like, this is what it's like for the law right now, because there is none of this stuff going on. It's the same as we were back when the Titanic was being built, uh, built in the Belfast shipyard, when people were in crazy bathing suits, and you know when people used to fight in this stance. Like that's how far behind we are with the practice of law. We're back in this era uh, because of the lack of business processes. So um, this is how this is the story. So I'm going to let Dave take over at this point. Yeah, and just to kind of dovetail on what Larry just said, it, it's it's not that um, in the book or 
you know, here in a seminar that we're critical of the way that law firms have done things. The, the point I think that Larry's making and that we try to make in the book is that, you know, when Henry Ford started looking at, you know, the way people were building cars, you know, more than a hundred years ago and said, you know, everybody sitting around and hand building a different car at the same time might not be the best way. Maybe if we start lining things up in a linear process um, and figure out what the best order of things would be, you know, we might be able to not only make, you know, cars better and more standardized, but we might be able to make and sell more of them. And so a lot of what the book is about isn't really to be critical of what lawyers are, are doing or not doing. It's to say, um, you know, the, the point Larry's making is all these other industries like automotive manufacturing, they've really moved ahead. You know, they've looked at things scientifically, you know, for more than 100 years and said, you know, what works and what doesn't work? And I know, um, and what's the most efficient way to do it? And where can we save things? And what are the metrics that really sort of drive all of this so that we know that we're headed in the right direction and doing the right things? Um, but, you know, that's for lawyers, at least, you know, and I've been a lawyer 25 years, so I came in kind of when computers were really just becoming mainstreamed into law firms. But a lot of what we do in a law firm today is still kind of an inheritance of what we learn from the people who came before us. You know, we do things a certain way, not because they're bad, but because sort of that's the way they've always been done. And, and I've noticed, and I think Larry's made this observation too, a lot of what we see in a law firm, even with you know heavy computer use, is that it's kind of like a computerized version of what we were doing 25 years ago. You know, we have certain you know undeniable changes like email, um, but there's so much more possible besides you know kind of a electrified version of the paper law office of you know 1970 um, that we can do, and so much of that involves not just like the actual um, technology itself, but putting it together in the right way and seeing your law firm as a system. So with that, Larry, I'm going to have to rely on you to click through this. And, um, you know, as Larry said, the sugar makes the medicine go down. So let me let me tell you kind of about our hero of the story. And Larry, can you click through this as I it, it, kind of talk about each slide? You bet. All right. So our story begins in Central City in November. And in the next slide, We'll meet, there's a law firm, it's called Cronus and Marx. It's where our hero, Carson Wright, works. And Carson one day finds himself in a meeting with his practice group at his big firm. And, you know, they're talking about the General Bearings case, you know, and this team that he's on, you know, it's some big multi-district litigation. But the undercurrent of the meeting is that we think we're going to get merged into a bigger firm. And what's going to happen to us if we do? You know, so these rumors swirl around and, you know, pretty soon, and Larry, if you'll switch that, we see that's exactly what happens to Carson. And he's a guy, you know, who's got 10 years into this law firm, joins it right out of school, and all of a sudden finds himself having to start over again. Um, so one day, as he's kind of wondering, well, what, to, what should I do next? Um, he is, and this is all happening around Thanksgiving time. So he's trying to be positive, get out there, Christmas shop for the kids. And one day he bumps into this guy who is somebody from his past, a guy named Ambrose Gray. And Ambrose Gray is this lawyer who's kind of legendary in Central City. He's a, you know, a small firm lawyer, but, you know, considered as, you know, a great trial lawyer, especially in his day. But the thinking is kind of, well, maybe Ambrose's day is a little bit behind him. And, Fortunately or unfortunately for Carson, Ambrose says, you know, I'm I'm struggling and, you know, I have this small firm and it's not what it used to be and I need your help, Carson. And I'd, I've, I've known you a long time and I want you to come work for me. So if you'll switch that slide there, we'll see that Carson has a decision he's got to make. This is the Ambrose Gray of yesteryear. And so Carson and his wife talk about it and she says, you know, Carson, if Ambrose trusts you, you know, trust yourself and give this a shot. So without really any other prospects or choices, Carson goes ahead and accepts the, uh, the job offer. And he comes to Mr. Gray's office and he says, I won't let you down. And so now it's January of this new year. Carson starts, you know, looking at the books because his mission and what he's been brought in specifically to do is to try to turn things around. You know, he's got a business degree. He's got, 
you know, background in a, in a professionally managed large firm. And so Ambrose thinks, you know, Carson's the man for the job. But when he starts looking at the books and starts looking at the numbers and what they've got coming in, what they've got going out, he sees it's worse than he's imagined. And so um, if you'll switch that, you know, he's working at, you know, from January on seven days a week, you know, just trying to find a way to make things better, you know, working, trying to make things better by just working harder. Um, which is what a lot of us do. And so he runs into one day he takes like a little bit of time off, goes to the bike shop. And the thing that I didn't tell you about Carson is he used to be like a very, very good cycle racer, you know, basically, you know, somebody who could become a professional. And um, he at the cycle shop, as he's just trying to clear his mind for a little, while, runs into this guy. And this is Guy Chapman, Chaplin. And Guy, you know, says, that's the Tsunami 6. It's a beauty, huh? Where, how have you been, Carson? And flip that slide, Larry. And, you know, let me tell you a little bit about Guy. You know, Guy, for one thing, was Carson's cycling coach. And when Carson was in high school and in college, he not only was, um, you know, a, a uh, cyclist in Guy's stable of cyclists for their uh, C2, um, professional cycling team, but he worked a little bit in Guy's factory, which is a very successful factory, you know, in Central City. It's one of these businesses that, you know, does very, very well. Um, and Guy says, you know, as Carson kind of can't lie to Guy because he's, you know, got a lot of respect for him and has known him a long time, says, let me tell you a story, Carson, about how the factory got to be this way. And Guy proceeds to talk about when he was a young man, you know, younger than Carson, you know, 17, 18 years old, um, and he went to race cycle, be a professional bicycles racer in Japan. And he got over there and, you know, it was tough, tougher than he thought it would be. He was kind of a hot shot locally. But when he got there, um, it was very difficult for him. But one thing that he did have going for him was that he was racing for a team called Miyoto Manufacturing. And he became acquainted with the owner, who was Mr. Miyoto. And one of the, you know, perks, if you could call it that, of being a cyclist, you know, making very little money as a professional cyclist, was you got a job in the factory. And so, Larry, if you'll flip that. And so you see, um, I, there we are. So, you know, I got to work out on the factory floor of this, you know, for at the, at the time, a very modern, um, well-run factory in Japan that made microwave ovens. So, and he became close to Mr. Miyoto, of course, too. So flip that slide. Um, the downside was that he had not been in Japan very long when he got a call from home. He gets a call from home. It's his mom, his dad, who started uh, and runs the cycle um, company, um, became, had a stroke. And so all of a sudden, Guy finds himself on a plane home. And when he gets home and sees how the factory is going, it's not going very well. Um, and he proceeds to tell Carson um, about all the struggles that they had in the factory and, and how Guy tried to work harder, tried to change things in isolation, how none of it ever worked. But then one day something finally clicked and he remembered the lessons that he'd learned from Mr. Miyoto. And if you'll flip that slide. And so what he tells Carson is, I'm going to help you, Carson, because I've been through this, too. I've been on the brink of bankruptcy in a business, and I've also had the good fortune to see, you know, how systems can be used to improve a business, and I've brought it back into this very successful cycling company. So the way our book unfolds after that, you saw the chapters at the beginning, is that each chapter is really a month, and it's a lesson that Guy gives for the month. There's, you know, dialogue, and, um, you know, you see there's comic book panels. And as the story unfolds, each one of those months is a lesson. And in, in the first month we talk about, you know, this is, uh, I think, February in our book, we talk about lean thinking and terminology, just to kind of acquaint you with what all this means. So, Larry, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, sure. All right, absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> you know, um, one of the things that is important to recognize is that it, it's not just because you're not doing something a certain way doesn't mean it ha it, it can't be done. And and just because um, you're doing something a certain way doesn't mean it can't be improved. So, you know, when you take a look at the the idea behind Henry Ford's factory building the Model Ts, you know, he did stuff that nobody ever did before uh, with the way he put together his assembly line. So um, 
you know, it's it's very creative, very uh, you really transformed the way people did things with factories. And there's, you know, a whole science behind this. And it, it's very interesting stuff. So we have two kind of seminal books that we're using here. And one is lean thinking. And, and the idea behind lean, it doesn't just mean to kind of trim costs. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about lean. We're, we're talking about a methodology that's a generalized word for what the Toyota production system was that was invented by a guy named Taiichi Ono. And then this is the other book, The Goal, that I was referring to, which really talks about something called theory of constraints and how bottlenecks and constraints work in uh, a sequence of operations, which is very interesting. And it, it, and it leads to kind of observations that you just can't optimize certain things because it could have a different effect, a negative effect on your entire system. So we're not talking about necessarily little tiny optimizations. We're talking about thinking of your law firm as a system. So that's like a big idea here. Um, we're going to introduce a couple of terms. So some of them are Japanese. This is the first one, Kaizen. Dave, this one's easy to say, I would say. <laughs> Kaizen. Kaizen is easy to say. And Kaizen is this idea of slow, continuous improvement. And in Toyota, they have a notion of something called true north, which is this idea of perfection. And they always strive for, 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 for perfection, but they realize that they're never going to attain it. So Kaizen is this idea of slow, continuous improvement. And it's how they kind of roll out their model years. So like the world of the Camry, and then they'll iterate on that design for five years, and then they'll roll out something, a, a new version of the Camry, and then they'll iterate and make it better over five years. And taking um, the lessons that they learned from the last one always, you know, too. That's that's a big idea. Yeah, they don't just improve it, just improve it. They they improve based on what they observe and measure. And another core concept of lean is this idea of waste uh, or muda. And Taichi Ono, uh, again, the founder of the system, identified about eight different types of waste or seven different types of waste. Not all of these are applicable to the law firm, but the idea is that you always want to be sensitive to work that does not add value. Is there stuff that you're doing that does not add value? And when they're talking about adding value, it's adding value for the client, right? In your sense, in, in the sense of a law firm. We're gonna be talking about key performance indicators, which are the most important numbers uh, that really gauge the performance of your firm. Um, I'd be curious to find out, just uh, asking people, please let me know if there's key performance indicators that you guys pay attention to and look at on a, on a uh, weekly, daily, or regular basis. Work in progress or WIP. And we're gonna be talking about the number of case units your law firm is processing at any given time. So Dave, what is a case unit? Well, a, a case unit is something that we've come up with for the book. And, you know, in trying to think of a way to measure, um, you know, we'll talk about this in a little bit, <clears throat> something called throughput, which is sort of the number of, you know, what lawyers think of, you know, as matters or cases that get from get across your finish line all the way to done within a given period of time. Like, it, let's just say you're a personal injury lawyer and you handle, you know, 150 cases a year, you know, and each case is worth $3,000 to you. I'm just going to make that up. And then, you know, your income over that year would logically be $450,000. What we had to figure out is that, um, you know, lawyers tend to think in terms of clients a lot of times. So if I represent Larry Port in a case and I file a lawsuit on behalf of him, you know, lawyers, you know, I'm calling myself out on this. We've traditionally thought of this as like, this is a case, right? And so when Larry's case is all the way done, then that's done. Well, the flaw in that thinking is that each one of these, you know, Larry's sued four extremely dangerous people in this lawsuit. And um, so each one of these things, you know, a lot of different things can happen. You, you could be dismissed as to one of these defendants. You could settle early with one of these defendants. You could go all the way to trial with another one of these defendants. And so we introduced the idea of the case unit because even though this is a single case, um, really these are four cases that all can move at different rates and be resolved at different times. So we try to break things down into case units that way. And the definition is anything that can be resolved in some way independently of, of something else. Um, and so this, in this situation, very simple example, we would actually have four case units because they could all um, start, they could all finish at a different time, even if they started at the same time. 
Very cool. Case unit, very key idea here. And we're going to be talking about throughput rate, which are the number of case units your law firm finishes during a given time. Dave, anything to mention here? Yeah, just very briefly, you know, we just said, you know, if you are a PI lawyer or personal injury lawyer and you finish 150 cases a year, that would be your throughput rate. It's just like miles per hour. You know, how many are we completing in a given unit of time? If you did 144 in a year, you know, you could also say, well, that's about 12 a month. Um, it's basically just a speed measure. And the only other point to make in that is plaintiff's lawyers, and I'm, I'm calling myself out again on this one, um, we tend to sometimes think of things as being done when they're not really all the way done. Like I've settled this case, but I don't have the money yet for this case. And so one of the things we discuss in the book is when is something really done? Because to get your measurements, your key performance indicators, you know, showing you true and accurate information, you have to actually make sure that when you say done, you mean done. And um, so that's, we have a very clear definition of what constitutes the finish line. Gotcha. All right, average unit value. Um, so the uh, so these are very core ideas, by the way, and we're going to be using these. So um, the average value in dollars to your firm of each case unit. Okay, so now you're starting to see where we're going with this. You have a case unit, you have a speed, you have throughput rate, and now we have average unit value or how much that case is worth, right? Um, and then there's cycle time. Dave, you want to talk a little bit about cycle time? Yeah, cycle time is, is, this slide says, the amount of time that a case unit spends between the day you accept it and the day that it's done. So we talked about throughput rate being that finish line. This is a measurement of how much time on average a case unit spends between the start and the finish line. And in general, the shorter that cycle time is, the greater your throughput rate is. And so we're going to you know, you do some lawyer math in a few minutes, nothing that's, you know, I'm an English major, so trust me, it can't be too hard, but um, we'll show you how cycle time um, relates to throughput rate and how those things are actually, you know, together with what we call inventory or work in progress, kind of all joined together. And then how you can, a lot of what our, our philosophy is about is, you know, how do we manipulate things so that cycle time gets shorter? You know, we're not talking about settling everything out on the cheap, but a way to make cycle time systemically shorter across the board um, by introducing efficiencies and removing constraints um, that will make that overall throughput rate, you know, and hence your profitability um, go up. So, first of all, I want to congratulate everybody. We're almost at the halfway point. And, um, you know, we're throwing some pretty crazy you know, ideas. If, at but you. if their if their heads exploded because of you know our introduction of math terms, and I say this as a lawyer, we would That's never right. know. That's the great thing about a webinar. Yeah, we don't know what's happening on the other side. Please use your question widget. If you look at your go-to uh, meeting control panel or your go-to webinar control panel, it's underneath the audio controls. There's a questions widget. Engage us and let us know uh, what questions you do have. So. Um, bottlenecks and constraints. This is a huge idea in the idea of theory of constraints, and it, it is a uh, shockingly simple idea. But the whole idea is that there might be something in your system that increases the cycle time. And there's an analogy in the book, The Goal, where he's, go he's going on a hike with his kid and his, uh, what are they called, Little League? No, it's not Little League. Boy Scouts. Cub Scouts. Boy Scout troops. Boy Scouts. Cub Scouts. I can't remember. I don't know why. So, he noticed that like the goal the goal for them is to get all the kids from point A to point B without any of the kids getting lost or eaten by a wolf or something like that. So um, they can only go as fast as the slowest kid. And the slowest kid in the book is this kid named Herbie. And they and it's kind of terrible because later on in the book, everybody in the factory starts referring to um, all the slow equipment. They start calling the slow equipment Herbies. So, but that was the observation that the, the troop can only go as fast as the slowest part of the process. So the, the, the process is limited, the, the entire system is limited by a bottleneck, um, which is an interesting observation, but also fairly common sense. Um, so at this time, Dave, take us through systems thinking. And, and, and this is gonna be kind of the bulk of the presentation for the most part. We're gonna go through the other stuff of the book too. But these are the real hardcore principles that we, we're trying to get people to wrap their heads around. And um, so, Dave, what can you tell us about systems thinking? 
Sure. Well, number one is the idea that the, the really big dramatic change that we're trying to get folks to make is to, to not see their law practice as like uh, sort of this unconnected you know relationship of different things they do or um, you know sort of this artisanal you know thing that we go in there and we craft these things and we do some of those things of course you know we want to do is make the best work product that we can but to be able to see that your practice is is a system because really every business is a system um, it, and it's because of the fact that all systems have constraints and inefficiencies in them that you're going to be able to make improvements. So Larry, if you switch that slide for me. Uh-oh. All right, so here's some math, right? Um, we start with the idea, again, that there's a system, and then while we've returned to these concepts of, okay, if you're in business and your business is a system, you know, why do you exist? You exist to solve people's problems, um, you exist to, you know, hopefully make the world a better place, you know, these sort of larger statements of mission, but you're also, you exist to, to make money. Um, you have to be profitable. If you're not profitable, then the next time somebody needs help, you're not there to help them. So one of our core missions, you know, what we want for ourselves and our family and what we need for our clients to continue is we need to be profitable. And so in the book, we introduced something called the, the income formula. And this is very, you know, simple. We just talked about this a minute ago. Um, how much money you make is going to be your throughput rate times your average unit value or what we call average case unit value. So again, very simply, if you put 144 cases from across the finish line in a year, that's your throughput rate. And to be really simple, we say each one of those is worth $1,000 to you in your pocket then that would be an income that year of $144,000. Um, so that's kind of our starting point. Super simple, right? Um, let's switch the slide. Dave, we got a question. Okay. The question is, what is the difference between throughput rate and cycle time? Ah, watch on for just a couple of minutes because I'm going to tell you that. The short answer is that, you know, what we're really trying to improve is throughput rate and the way that we're going to do that is to shorten cycle time, or one of the big ways we're going to do that is to shorten cycle time. So we're going to show a formula called Little's Law in a second, and then we'll, I'm going to show you exactly that, what I mean by that. So, you know, again, wrapping your heads around, so stay tuned, and then if you have a follow-up question, you can post it. Um, Larry, we talked about this, you know, we're getting people to see, oh, my law firm is not that different from a car factory or, you know, any other kind of factory. What about what other kinds of businesses, Larry, are there? Flip the slide and let's see. Right, and let's dwell on this for just one second. Well, you know, we think of ourselves as being different than everybody else, because maybe because we're a service industry, or maybe because we're, you know, not civilians, we're lawyers. But what we're doing is the same as what every business on the face of the earth does, which is it gets some kind of a raw material. You know, in a vehicle factory, it would be steel, rubber, all these other things. In our line of work, it's people with problems or companies with problems or companies that want to merge or, you know, they want they have something that they want to achieve legally. And that's our raw material. We put them through some kind of a process, it might be a litigation process, it might be a negotiation process, it might be a contracting process. And out of that process at C, you know, we get money. And then we take that money and we put it into making our process better. We put it into marketing for more raw material and we put it in our pockets. And that's how every factory, every business, every everything, you know, is, exists to make money works. It's the same way, pretty much. Um, so go to the next slide, Larry. So is it different than a car factory? No. Is it different than a donut shop? No. I love this slide. And I love this slide. Dave actually <laughs> went out and took pictures of these people. Yeah, with their consent, I might add. Um, okay. I wasn't wearing like a buttonhole cam or anything like that when I did this. And you can see because, you know, the gentleman who's at the front of the Duck Donuts cash register is throwing me up some kind of ambiguous gang sign. But um, <laughs> whatever, whatever donut cartel he's involved in, I don't even want to know. Um, so let's look at, you know, let's think about a donut shop. This is a place called Duck Donuts, which in the southeast, I don't know if they have it in Florida, but they have it in South Carolina, North Carolina. And it is the, I mean, it is. It's, it's a donut that will literally just shut down your pancreas like immediately upon <laughs> eating it. Um, it's that good. So, but if you could, if you're feeling kind of blue, you're feeling kind of sad, you walk into Duck Donuts, you know, here at the left side, um, you say to this guy, here's what I want. And they have things laid out in a linear process. 
they say, okay, our system is this. Take the order. We make the donut. You know, you watch us make the donut. It pops out. Uh, this girl who's over here on the right puts the sprinkles on it or puts the icing on it. They have a sprinkle station after that, and it pops out at the other end. I've already, they've gotten my money on the front end of this transaction. Uh, and then here come a dozen donuts right out the other end, all in a couple of minutes, all before my eyes, all made to my order exactly how and when I want it. And they've gotten my money and solved my problem. Um, our law firms are quite a bit like this, if you think about it. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Dave, we have another question. Okay. Um, the question is, can you get Captain Crunch on the donut? <laughs> I think you can get, you can get almost anything on those donuts. I think they put like a machine bolt, you know, on the donuts if you wanted them to. But, um, it's very, very, if, if you haven't tried it, try it. Is that a real okay. question? No, no, it was not okay. a real question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So back to our, you know, model here. Um, so for duck donuts, you know, if every donut's a dollar, they're, I assure you they're not. But if every donut is, you know, three dollars um, and they are going to sell so many in a certain amount of time, they can calculate very easily what their income is. All right. So let's go to the next slide. OK. All, All right. right. So we're, I don't know that we're going to be able to necessarily zoom into this one like we were able to live. So we're just going to have to kind of work through this one. Yeah, here is the question about cycle time. Here's how it all fits together. So again, our income formula is our throughput rate times our average case unit value, or it would be average donut unit value if we were at a donut shop. Um, we already talked about what that average unit value is. That's the value in dollars to your firm of each case unit. Um, and my slide is somewhat blanking out on me here. So we may have to reload that one, Larry. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into the um, creation view as okay. so that we can like really zoom into this thing nice. um, and Great. make it easier for everybody to see. Even so better. let's do this. All right. So where are we here? You're talking about um, go to, go to average unit value. Rate. Yeah. All right. So throughput rate. I actually scroll out just a little bit if you don't mind. All right. So Better. we can see, we'll go up so we can see average case unit value and throughput rate at the same time. There you go. Good. Okay. So average unit value, what you can't see in this bubble is I make the point that that's kind of hard to change. You know, you can charge $2 for a donut. You can charge $3 for a donut. But if you try to charge somebody $10 for a donut, they may not, pretty soon the people are going to stop coming to duck donuts no matter how good they are. Um, and the same is true for us lawyers. We can charge, if you're billing by the hour, there's a certain rate that the market will bear. If you are on a contingency fee and you have a personal injury or some other kind of a case that you're taking that way, maybe a jury gets to decide how much that's worth. Um, you know, you can do things to make the case better, of course. You can be a better lawyer, uh, but you, in the end, don't get to decide the value of those things. So, when we talk about an income formula being average unit value times throughput rate, we say, well, average unit value, you could do a little bit to tinker with that, but that's kind of hard to change. What about throughput rate? Is that easy to change? And the answer to that is surprisingly very easy to change. And the reason why is something called Little's Law. And without, and John Little was this guy who was a professor at MIT, and um, you can Google Little's Law and learn all about it. Basically, he described and outlined the relationship between inventory, your work in progress, how much you have between your start and finish at any given time on average, which is your work in progress, um, and throughput rate and average cycle time, which we just call cycle time. So average inventory equals throughput rate times uh, average cycle time. If you go down to the bottom, I mean, you don't have to move it, Larry, but you see we, we using a little bit of algebra, change that to around so that we see that R, which is throughput rate, equals work in progress divided by cycle time. So what does that tell us? That tells us that by shortening our cycle time, if we want to increase our throughput rate, I'll just kind of cut to the chase at the, at the off this bottom one with our R equals WIP over CT formula. If we want to make our throughput rate faster, we manipulate the inventory by, we manipulate inventory, and I'll come back to that, and the most important thing is we decrease the average cycle time. And the way that we do that, the way we make our, the amount of time it takes from start to finish 
for a, for a case get a lot shorter is by getting rid of the constraints so that the system flows faster. There's nothing that's blocking it. Um, we make each individual task take less time by standardizing things, by automating things. And we get rid of the biggest sin in a law office, which we all commit all the time, which is stuff waiting around for no reason. It's not blocked by anybody else or, it, you know, the, it's you're not. We have so many things that sit around in law offices that sit there, not because um, they are, um, you know, there's a, a, a civil procedural rule that, you know, we can't take the next step because of like, you know, you file a complaint, you can't control when the other person answers, you know, it's going to be 30 days and you can't change that. Um, we're talking about situations where stuff sits in your law firm, like you don't file a complaint or you don't serve discovery and it's just sitting there for no reason or for, you know, another reason, um, the fact that there's only one of you or two of you or five of you and something, you know, somebody in your firm is waiting on you to do something or vice versa. What we try to do by maybe doing a little bit less inventory and try to be very aware of what our system looks like and visualize that system is when that waiting time is happening, where those constraints are so that we can attack those and fix those. That's what makes the system flow faster, and that's what decreases cycle time, and that's what makes throughput rate go up. So that's now, about as much math as we're going to kick at. You. Okay. If you have glazed like a duck donut, um, audience, um, what I would suggest is to, well, you could buy our book, but that would be a shameless plug. But, um, you know, we'll pass out the slide deck and you can stare at it and so on and so forth. But, you know, the, the one of the big takeaways is, is that you, it is so impactful when you eliminate some of these times in your, in your work process where you aren't moving the ball forward on a case um, when it's in your court to do so. So it, it really has an impact on your profitability. All right, back to the donuts. Sure, and you can go on past this, but you know, just to we're, we're going to show you something called a Kanban board or Kanban board, as Larry likes to say. Um, I love saying Kanban. 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 Yeah, we'll get to that. But that's a way that you can actually see when these things are happening, see when something's waiting around for no reason, or see when something is blocked. And and it's that visualization of your system that gives you all the power to change it. So again, just to recap. We'll go through these next three slides quickly. You reduce cycle time by optimizing constraints. That means getting rid of or widening bottlenecks. That's right. The Herbies. Okay. The Herbies. Yeah. Next. And this is just a, you know, this is the Herbie illustration. You know, if you have a system that otherwise could be as capable of producing, you know, 70 units per day, whatever is the slowest moving part of that is going to dictate the outcome of how that system. Yeah, and this was like a big deal in factories because they get these, like especially in the goal, the analogy is they would get these robots that'd be super, super fast at doing what they did. But the line didn't go any faster because they had certain machines that had a constraint. So it didn't matter how fast the robots were, they still had their constraint. Yeah, if your robot can produce 100 units, you know, a minute, but the one that comes next in the process can only do 10, then you're never going to go faster than 10. And you're also going to see things pile up like crazy behind the one that can do 10. Um, so we reduce cycle times again by minimizing this waiting time that we can control, what we call waiting for no reason time. Okay. And then the next slide. You shorten the wait times that you can't control by reducing inventory. So waiting time that's caused by what we call in an industry, they call resource scarcity, which means we don't got enough lawyers to do all this stuff. Part of that is a, part of that is a symptom of having too many things in inventory at once. So by modulating our inventory, inventory or steering it like you would a rudder on a ship, you can you can actually calculate what your optimum inventory would be and then try to get towards that. That will make cycle time shorter. Okay. All right. So how does this work with hourly billing? The elephant in the room, so to speak. Should I answer that question? <laughs> the short well. answer, yeah, I'll answer it very quickly. It doesn't work as well with hourly billing. And the reason is, is because hourly billing, as you've probably heard um, from other people, you know, not only do clients not always like it, I understand it's a necessary evil and, and sometimes it's probably the best way to bill. Um, 
in it for a certain kind of a case, but from a profitability standpoint, an hour is always an hour. And so the only way you can ever get more money, make more income, is either by raising that hourly rate, which just like the $10 donut, there's only so much the market will bear, or working more hours. Or if you're you know, in a big firm, you can add more lawyers and do the traditional pyramid thing, which works great if you're near or at the top, not so great when you're down in the galley pulling on the oars maybe, but um, the great thing about going to like a flat fee billing arrangement for something that normally people would think of as hourly um, is that you get all the advantages of making your system better. You get the advantages of those things and your clients get them too because they get a better product typically in a shorter time, which is what they wanted in the first place. Um, and of course, in any kind of a contingent billing system, this works fabulously well. Okay. So we're going to go through KPIs, what, when, and how to measure. Um, so KPIs are very important. Uh, it's This illustrates a dashboard um, that we hope that you have, or if not, are thinking of put, putting together, or after this might decide to put together. Um, but so what we have listed here are what we think are the critical measurements. So your cash position or your cash quantity. I know this every single day. I know how much cash we have available. And the reason why is because it's oxygen. It's oxygen for a business, and a law firm is a business. Your cash pipeline, do you know how much cash you can expect coming in? How much is coming down the pike towards you? That would be great, wouldn't it, if you were able to predict that, and you can predict it as, as it turns out. What's your collection percentage? You're sending a lot of bills out. Um, how much of that are you collecting? Do you know that? Uh, has it gotten better? Has it gotten worse? Are certain people doing a better job of that? Work in progress. And, and let me point out one thing about that. You know what your collection percentage is if you bill, if you use flat fees instead of hourly fees? It's 100%. How much, Dave? It's 100%. There you go. So, one more reason. Yes. And also, if you are hourly, um, accepting credit cards can make a major dent in your collection percentage. Uh, you know, work in progress. How much stuff are you working on? How many cases are you working on? What's their unit value? How much are they worth? Your, and the other things that we talked about are throughput rate and cycle time. So, um, and here's why numbers are important and measuring these things are important because it allows you to improve. So if you take your first set of measurements, that's known as benchmarking. And then what you wanna do is you want to execute and then you wanna get better. And, um, and so Agile is this methodology, it's, it's an umbrella methodology for things called like Scrum and extreme programming that were big in software. And it's one of the reasons why software has gotten better. If you remember software, it used to be a lot buggier and a lot more screwed up, but you know, over the past 10, 15 years, it's gotten a lot better. So, and one of the reasons that is, is because instead of just putting everything out there at once, we reduce a little bit and just like keep on getting better. But you take that and you take that to your marketing and then you can think about your marketing numbers and see how those get better. So the whole idea is that you measure, you put up a strategy and you execute on that strategy and then you measure at the end of a cycle, like a week, a month, two weeks, whatever it is. And then you go and you do the cycle again and you keep on measuring and you see yourself improving. So that's a big deal. Um, bringing your systems to life. All right, so we're gonna get into talking about some Kanban, or as Dave likes to call it, Kanban. And um, this is a major, 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 major thing. So we don't have that much time left, Dave. So I, I, I don't know about you, but I feel like um, and we talk about this on our podcast. I feel like Kanban is worth the time for us to discuss. Yeah, I think if there's one thing that we really try to cover, it would probably be this. Um, and, and here's why. You know, and what you're seeing in this slide is this is on a factory floor. This is a board that everybody who's on the factory floor working mm -hmm. there in this huge facility can see. And what this is telling them is where are things in my system? Where where does this particular order um, lie in the system. Where are the problems in this system? You know, I can see if something's lit up that maybe there's a bottleneck um, there. This is a, you know, a, a sort of a technical way to visualize this, you know, for a factory. Uh, you know, these obviously are codes that mean something specific to them. But the problem in a law firm traditionally has been, you know, we don't work in big spaces like this and we don't have some giant board like, uh, you know, that everybody can see. Um, and so, Larry, if you'll switch to the next slide, you know, what you could do is you could say very simply, you know, 
we could put a whiteboard up in the conference room and we could have little stickies and we could put them for where each case is, you know, just an indicator visually of where each case is. And that would be kind of helpful. And that's good. Um, except that, um, you know, it doesn't show you what you're really capable of seeing with software. And so let's go to the next slide. So one of the great things that um, one of the really transformational things in my own practice was when we started using um, what I guess I would refer to as a virtual Kanban. I tried, Larry. Virtual Kanban board, which is something that um, shows us, you know, what our system looks like. This is a mock-up, obviously. Our, our real one is far more uh, colorful than this and has a lot of um, symbology in it to tell us, you know, A, who's handling what, B, what is being, you know, blocked by somebody else and who's blocking it, um, what's moving too slowly, where the bottlenecks are, all this good stuff. But the heart of this um, is that we have a left to right visualization of our system. We have things come in on the left as a prospect. It goes into some kind of a queue where it waits to be acted on. You know, if we were in litigation, we could say, well, now we filed the case. Now the case is, you know, kind of in this waiting period, or it's this period where we're maybe doing discovery. You know, this is a fairly gross oversimplification of what it would really look like. But, um, you know, the point of this is that we have a left to right process where we go from something coming in as raw material on the one end all the way to where it's finished, and that we can see what's going on in this system every day in real time um, and see who's responsible for what, what's getting blocked, where the constraints are, what's moving too slow all at once. Dave, I'm going to switch to Kanban because it's just easier to say. But yeah, I like it um, better too. Yeah. When I first started talking to Dave about this stuff, one thing I thought was notable and I'd like to point out here is that the cards that you move through these lanes are cases. They're not tasks. Because in our instance, you know, we have a whole engineering Kanban board set up where we have things like, um, you know, waiting for design, um, in engineering, needs QA, uh, in production, so on and so forth. And they're, they're, they're not cases, they're like features that go through there. So you don't have something, you don't have a card that says pleading, it's a case that goes through the system. Oh, and so tell me about your beautiful visualization. Right, and that's actually, cool. yeah, and actually, yeah. Oh yeah, no, it's actually a case, like a case unit. So you can actually, since they move independently, you can, you can tra track them in real time the, the beauty of a product like Trello which we just saw is a lot of add-ins for it and there are a lot of um, ways that be, because it's all computerized that the Kanban were measured um, this is something that is from my own firm that's measuring how many cases I have um, it's basically for each month um, for the last six months so I can see exactly what has gotten across that finish line in a given period of time um, that is something I don't have to ever record. It's something that is reading off of my Kanban board and giving me back those numbers. If you go to the next slide. Dave, is this the mountain you climbed last summer? So this is telling me my cycle time. Not every day, Larry. This is um, showing me what my cycle time is right now. And I have, you know, I said at the beginning of, of the year, a goal cycle time. Um, and I can see if I'm on it or not. Um, and this is also showing me, strangely, this is also measuring the existence of a bottleneck here in this brown category, where things like with that machine, when something starts to jump up like that, how it pushes everything up, that's showing you that your cycle time is going up because of a constraint someplace here. So we addressed that and fixed it. But we wouldn't know it existed if we didn't visualize things this way. Hey, Dave. Before you go on to the next slide, I do have to read the CLE yes. code for our Florida Bar guests. And that code is 2997. So that is the Florida Bar CLE code. Again, that's 2997. I'll read that one more time. It's 2997. Okay, Dave. Okay, yeah, and I'll just one more. Uh, this is, these are actually KPIs. You know, we talk about measuring our work in progress. 
this is my work in progress. At this point in time, I had an average of 86 case units open. And you can see that when that bottleneck went up, one of the things that we started to do to respond to it, and there's always a little bit of lag to it, is we said, you know, what, we're not introducing anything new into the system. We're going to burn through some stuff that we got to drop our inventory to get our cycle time back down. It's one of the ways that you can manipulate that. But again, without visualizations, you know, like this that are automatically measuring my Kanban board in real time, we wouldn't know this was happening. Or how to address it and by the way uh, and you know we're gonna uh, burn a couple minutes here on marketing but you might not need marketing um, if, if you're have if you're concerned about your profitability or your cash flow look what Dave did in this example he didn't bring anything new on he just finished what he already had because getting stuff across the finish line is what ultimately results in him getting paid so and, and this happens a lot with law firms they think they just need more and more clients more and more matters when in reality they need to finish the work they already have yeah, and to be clear, I mean, it's not like you you don't stop marketing. It's that you, um, you know, you're continuing to work on your raw material, your leads. But what you might do, for example, is once you take on that case, um, you don't maybe immediately introduce it into the system because remember, your goal is not how many cases can I handle at once. It's how fast can I move them across in a given period of time. Which is, if you want to get really you know, big picture about it, it's your career. You know, we don't last forever. It's not, you know, we're kind of like football players in a very stretched out way in that, you know, we have a certain amount of time where we're going to earn income as lawyers and we have to make the most of that time. So it's that rate becomes very important when you realize it's, look, I'm not going to be around doing this forever. Um, I have a certain amount of time to uh, make hay while the sun shines. Here's the thing about marketing, if we could just move on to this one, and this is probably going to have to be our last topic, but my message is, is that if you're not measuring, you're not marketing. We talked about KPIs. Well, there's KPIs for marketing, too. It, you definitely should invest a little bit in to, uh, of time in, in learning the most important things when it comes to marketing because I just see people get uh, snake oiled all the time with some of these SEO and digital advertising agencies. Um, the, the ones to pay attention to, and we explain this in the book, are new leads per month, new clients per month, cost per click, how much you're paying for digital advertisement, number of impressions or number of times your ads are being shown, how many, what the, what the rate is of how many times they're being shown, um, you know, divided by the number of times they've been clicked or vice versa, actually, the number of clicks divided by the number of impressions is your click-through rate, and then your website metrics, you know, how many visitors, how many new visitors, how many... You know, um, are you attracting the right people from where? And um, the last, uh, so so I guess we're giving marketing just a little bit of a, a short change there, but let's just talk briefly about standardization and, and checklists and whatnot. But um, the, we have a picture of this plane. What is this plane called again? I can never remember. Uh, let's see, I'm not on the plane. Like That's a, a B-29. Yeah, okay, so this is a B-29 bomber. And there was an incident where it crashed like right after takeoff. And as a result of this, and this is um, chronicled in this really cool book called uh, The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawanda. And he goes on to explain that checklist became the staple of the aviation industry because like one simple step was missed in this. So, um, you know, it, aviation kind of leads the charge actually in a lot of different fields, automation too. There's a great book called The Glass Cage by Nicholas Carr that talks a lot about this. But um, back to checklists and automation, like um, these things work. Uh, they reduce errors, they standardize procedures, and uh, they should be a staple of a law firm that wants to have consistent systems in place. Uh, Dave, what are we looking at here? This is uh, from the World Health Organization. Yeah, it's just an example from the same uh, author, uh, Gawande, about the, uh, you know, he's a surgeon. And so one of the things they introduced that was, you know, seemingly he, surgeons are the ultimate uh, people who would consider themselves artisans, you know, and rightly so. But, you know, one of the things that he discovered and talks about in the book is that they would make really dumb mistakes because they weren't doing the same thing the same way every time. And those mistakes could be avoided just by going through a very simple checklist. And the thing that we talk about in the book, you know, in terms of the impact on shortening cycle time is that when you do something repetitively the same way every time, it gives you opportunities to improve it over time, you know, iterations like Larry talked about. It makes sure you don't miss something stupid like 
they missed they put didn't put the flaps down on the b29 so they crashed this thing on its maiden voyage even though mechanically it was perfect um and the, the other benefit is you get really fast at it and so that shortens your cycle time from a marketing standpoint when you have a more narrowly focused um practice you know where you do the same things the same way over and over again and you you uncover the ways to do those you know the very best way you get really good at that kind of a case that makes you very in demand and even if you're billing hourly or if you are billing hourly that's a way that you could go up on your rate because you're somebody that you know can put together a better finished product consistently than your competition so dave um we didn't really get into um the um the meetings part of it um i will say um we really have to and we didn't even get into con, um, technology as well um, but the core idea is that there's a couple of meetings that we recommend there's one called the retrospective where you talk about what you what you should start doing what you should stop doing and you, what you should continue doing and if you're going to implement one thing this would be a good thing to implement you know because this is where okay we should start using kanban boards and you do this once a month and you talk about how to improve your law firm in terms of tech you know, we espouse this belief that, you know, you don't want to use a cool because it's tool. You want to use it because it's going to help you somehow. And one of the biggest things that tech can do is it can reduce cycle time by increasing automation and eliminate waste, right? That's where tech really shines when it comes to this system. Um, so I guess that's where we're going to have to end this thing because it's three o'clock on the nose. Um, what? Dave. What a study in efficiency that was for us, Larry. Right? Yes, we seemed to time it better when we did this at the ABA Tech Show, but we got, you know, we got through everything, although we had to skip through some slides. Sure. We are available for questions if you want to follow up with us, if you want us uh, to come speak at your law firm and stuff like that. That might be something we could do as well. Uh, maybe I should speak for myself on that one, Dave. But um, you can reach me at Larry at RocketMatter.com and on Twitter at Larry Port. I am no longer on Facebook. It's, people are upset about that all over the country. I know people are upset. All right, so Dave, what about you? Uh, you can reach me at Twitter at, at Consumer Law SC, uh, or you, it's fine to email me. I actually am on Facebook, but you know I have more followers than friends. I don't know what that says about me, but um, e either way is fine. Happy to help anybody that I can help, uh, any fellow lawyer. Uh, somebody congratulated me on leaving horrible Facebook. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So if you left too, um, Ms. Uh, John, who wrote that in, then I congratulate you as well. So um, definitely do not be shy. Reach out to us. Uh, the, uh, go to our website. It's leanlawfirmbook.com. Check out our podcast. You can listen to our witty banter uh, as much as you possibly want to. Uh, and I'm through. off to the bookstore to buy The Glass Car by Nicholas Cage. Good recommendation. Yeah, The Glass Cage by Nicholas Carr. Oh, well, that's way less interesting. Okay, sorry. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks.